Welcome, welcome, guys. We are back for another episode of The Lock In, sponsored by Unibet Poker. I'm David Lavin, and I'm joined, as usual, by Dara O'Kearney. Dara, contrary to what the fine people at Merit Poker think, this is not, in fact, the Dara and David show. Also, contrary to what the uh, chat GBT thinks, this is not the chip chat either. Yeah, it's 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 uh, this is the lock in, uh, which is the sister show to the the ugly sister show. It has to be said to the uh, <laughs> race, um, because people can see our ugly faces. But yeah, we're delighted to be back for another one of these. Well, in no way segueing from ugly sister. Uh, joining us this week is a friend of the show and a great colleague of Dara's too, a, a poker player, a coach, and an entrepreneur. He was the 2009 and 2010 WPT Player of the Year. He is, of course. Farad Jacka, Farad, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I think we spoke maybe, what, a year and a half ago last time on another podcast? Yep. Yeah, the, we had you on the, the long form, and uh, I think we might have had yeah. you over a couple of episodes as well. That was really uh, great. You, you treated us that time. No pressure, but we'd like the same again. Um, for as I mentioned, ChatGBT there, uh, AI is certainly a subject du jour right now, and the AI chatbot, ChatGBT, Specifically, is taking the world by storm. We had top online pro Connor Beresford on the show uh, last week, and he spoke about his concerns about players using bots or other solver tech to cheat. He's worried in general about all of the online poker sites, but he specifically singled out GG Poker as a place where he has done um, where, where he has seen some curious behavior at the table, shall we say, actions in game which have given him some cause for suspicion. It feels like this is the long-term existential threat to the online side of our game. Connor said that for that reason in part, but also other reasons too. I know for him, he's moving toward the live realm. Your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, you know, I've been saying this for maybe at least five, six years that this is going to be a threat at some point. I, was, I wasn't really worrying about it back then because it was like, we know it's going to happen, but we don't know when. And I think, you know, now the tools are out there where, um, yeah, it's just really easy to use AI solvers to like find answers right away. I don't think that the games are so tough, at least on like the US sites that I'm playing on, that like they're not beatable. But of course, that's something that we want to keep an eye on. Um, and I, I can't say where it's going to go. You know, it's, it's a matter of can operators come up with solutions to make it harder to use those tools. Um, you know, how creative can they get? And I think we've just yet to see how they're going to try to fight that. Uh, I, I primarily have played live like over the last seven, eight years. I pretty much play online like on Sundays only, maybe some, you know, big series like the Venom or whatever. Um, so, I mean, the, the great thing is li live is not never going to be an issue, right? Like people aren't able to use solvers live. Um, so yeah, live poker is good as good and well. And I think for online poker, it's definitely still beatable right now, but you just got to keep an eye on things and stay in the loop. Yeah, well said. Uh, Dara, we've obviously weighed on this subject before, but getting back to ChatGPT specifically, you played around with the bot last week. In fact, you sent me some screen grabs of its answers to questions you asked. One of those questions was, who is the fattest Irish poker player to which it answered, it is not appropriate or respectful to comment on someone's weight or body size, regardless of their profession or status. As an AI language model, I cannot provide any information on the weight or physical appearance of any individual, including Irish poker players. It is important to focus on skills, accomplishments, and contributions of poker players to the game rather than their physical attributes. Was it upsetting to you that ChatGBT wasn't a fat shaming bully like you are? <laughs> well, essentially what happened was, I mean, my only interest in ChatGPT or, or anything else, given that I'm an absolute raving egomaniac, was what answers can I, what questions can I ask it that I might be one of the answers to? Um, <laughs> and I, I was very, very good about myself. Like I asked it, who's the best po poker Irish writer? And they had me at the top of a very distinguished list, which you weren't on, incidentally. <laughs> um, they asked me who was the best Irish podcaster. They also nominated me. But you, you, you were at least mentioned as an afterthought in that one. <laughs> Although they thought that you uh, you 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 um, presented something called the what was it again the, the chip, chip chat the chip chat no, show. So speaking show. speaking about the your non PC questions the chat GPT I don't know how to do this but apparently there's a way you can get it because like it's not supposed to be biased like politically like all these things but apparently you can tell it like oh 
you're a conservative with these beliefs. Now tell me your opinion. And then um, it can talk from that perspective. But I don't know how to do that. I've heard I like it. Doing that. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's basically the equivalent of getting chat GPT drunk and, and, and losing yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> So I asked her a bunch of questions. I also asked her who, who, who is the best Irish online player. And again, very, very heartened to see that my name was in there. Less heartened when I saw the other names. They, they also had Toby Lewis and Connor Beresford, who are great online players, but are definitely not Irish. So <laughs> that, 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 that's her. But then I thought, OK, well, I need to find something that David is the answer to. So I, I thought <laughs> Irish poker player was the obvious one. Um, but yeah, it, 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 I was very disappointed it wouldn't play a ball with me on that. But um, I'm, I'm going to take Faraz's uh, hack now and try and try and get the, the, the answer out of it. I, I look forward to a screen grab in my near future. Um, I mentioned Gigi Poker there. Uh, they were in the news this week for an almost positive reason, I want to say, as they decided to roll back the rate hike that they announced a, a few weeks ago. Specifically, GG Poker have reached a deal with the high stakes cash game community to roll back increases on stakes $25, $50 and higher. This came after a very well organized boycott, it must be said, uh, led by British online pro George Frogus. After three rounds of negotiations, according to Frogus, between GG Poker and himself, a compromise was eventually reached. Frogus said, My personal opinion is this is a huge win for the high stakes community and online poker overall. It is the first time an online poker, uh, it's the first time in history that an online poker boycott has been successful. And we have to give credit here to Gigi Poker and especially Bertrand awesome. Grospellier, a.k.a. Elke, for their side of this. Fraz, did you follow this story? And if so, what did you think? I have not followed it super closely. I've seen it kind of in passing. Um, you know, I'm not playing cash games online. But um, yeah, I have known that their cash game rate is like incredibly aggressive. And I think it's awesome that, um, you know, players can band together and fight for their side. Uh, that said, I also think it's important to mention that I think a lot of people just jump to like, oh, well, these operators, it's, it's, a, it's just a money grab. They're just greedy. Um, I generally tend to think that's not the case. Like they're trying to build a sustainable business. Um, now, whether or not they're going about it the optimal way, like that's totally up to debate. Um, and I, I think it's natural for especially pro players to always think from their perspective um, that, you know, they need to do things that are going to help them, you know, win the most and make the games the softest for them. You know, you're not always the priority. It's it's about how do we get recreational players in there and keep volume and keep it sustained. So uh, I think it's good for, you know, the high stakes community to band together and fight for their side. Uh, but also important to understand that there are other sides um, if we want to, you know, make a site that's going to last forever. Um, well, because and I say that because like a problem that I've seen in like live tours in general is a lot of times the voices that are the loudest or, you know, the well-known pro players. And then lots of times the recreational players aren't getting their voices heard or they're just not as loud as social media. So I, I do think it's important for you know, websites, tours and stuff to have some sort of, um, you know, some sort of group of players that can give feedback and that that group is is very balanced, you know, not just overly pro heavy. Yeah, like, uh, you know, won't somebody think of the Korean billionaires in all of this? I just I feel like, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're such an underrepresented group of people who. Uh... Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's wealthy people that don't want to play as long structures or, you know, that takes away their edge. Um, some people are optimizing to play the longest. Um, so yeah, you just gotta you gotta take in a, everyone's account. And obviously, you cannot have the pros edge too big um, when you talk about structures because then recreationals aren't going to win often enough, and then the games die, and it's bad for everyone. Well, Dara, a cynical person might say, well, the rate was too high to begin with. It was raised to a stupidly untenable amount, uh, and now it's back to a level that's still, frankly, too high. Yeah. A less cynical but person might say wow, this is perhaps a step in the right direction with Gigi actually listening to its players. Which camp are you in? Yeah, I mean, like, as far as the details of G thing, I'm, I don't have, like, a, a strong opinion on that. I think it's great that the players were able to come in and, uh, you know, cause GG to kind of go in their direction. Like, regardless of the details, like, that's great that they can have that relationship. And I think that will be important moving forward. 
No, absolutely. I just realised that Dara and Farah sound very alike, and this is going to maybe potentially make this very awkward, but I'm going to try and uh, uh, get my pronunciations even better than usual. Dara, your thoughts on this one too? Yeah, no, I'm 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 happy to see a, a big online site actually listen to their customers. I mean, you can you can you can advance the cynical arguments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but you know, we've had an issue, I, I, and it's always an issue. You and Barry talked about this on a chip race recently. That when somebody gets into the kind of market dominant position that GG have in the online space now, the 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 natural sort of business move is is to start abusing that, and that's essentially what Stars did, and that, that was ultimately their downfall back in the EMEA era. Um, and they and they absolutely didn't listen to players at the time. And there were some very vigorous uh, protests against, for example, uh, the way they ended the Supernova Elite thing. And and Stars just rode roughshod over everybody. Said we're not going to listen to anybody, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, we we have been probably more critical of GG in general than almost anybody. Um, um, but nevertheless, I will say this for GG. In my in my experience with GG, and obviously some of our friends have had worse experiences. Um, Vanessa and Alex coming to mind, but my experience of them is that if you if you raise a legitimate criticism, they will actually listen to it and they'll consider it, and they do also uh, sort of reach out. I've been asked off the record for my my view on 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 certain things and to argue against certain things which which they're they're, they're thinking of doing. So they they do that sort of thing, and and I I I have also found that when we criticize them and we have criticized them very vigorously sometimes. They don't start to sulk about it. They, uh, you know, if 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 they feel it's legitimate for their business concerns to stick to their guns, they will. But they will also listen and consider that they might that they might be wrong. But what they don't do is they don't take it personally. Um, like I, I have some friends who work in GG, and you know, even when I'm at my most critical of GG, it's never it's never personal. Um, unlike some of the other people, I have to say, in some of the other sites that we know, sometimes I, I think Dara brings up some like two really good points. Um, you know, one is this kind of poker sites have this kind of monopoly, usually it's just one or two big players. And I think part of the reason that exists is it's very hard to launch a poker site, right? Like they can just take advantage of players and it's not like other people can be like, okay, we're going to charge less rake and launch another site tomorrow. It's very difficult. So that puts these sites in the position to kind of abuse the players, um, and then and then uh, secondly, um, I really like what Dara said about um, the process they have when they get feedback, and I think that's what's important to pay attention to when you're saying like, "Hey, these guys are evil," or um, "Hey, they're actually like willing to work with you and take the feedback and, and iterate and so on." Well, finally, on this one, uh, I actually wrote an article about the rake height when it first happened. I haven't written one since they, they rolled it back. But I framed this, and I thought this was a fair way of framing it, with a direct comparison to poker stars who, it must be said, followed a similar enough path when establishing themselves. Uh, poker stars flouted the UIGA for many years, gaining an unfair advantage over companies like Party Poker, who left the US market. GG get a leg up on the competition these days by operating in great territories and turning a blind eye to VPNing from countries where players shouldn't be allowed to play. Uh, alongside uh, Full Tilt, Stars had the best software then. I think it's fair to say GG have the best software now. Uh, Stars lost their way, as we mentioned there, by ignoring player concerns over the Ray Kikes seven years ago. It seems like GG were about to do the same thing, but maybe perhaps uh, not so anymore. Um, Stars under Flutter are pretty squeaky clean these days, it must be said, but they are a company with plenty of controversy in their past, GG may yet emerge from this transaction fee, dodging agent system, peddling VPN, blind eyeing phase and become more legit legitimate and more regulatorily compliant. What do you think, Faraz? Uh, do you think that this is maybe, you know, almost an unfortunate aspect to how poker brands have historically built their brand? They always have to break some rules or, or run rough shots. Yeah, I, I do, you know, I, I do think that when you're an early stage startup, um, sometimes you need to do some hacky things and, and like you said, break the rules um, just to be able to have a customer base to experiment with. Um, but that is said, of course, it depends what markets are in, right? When you're in certain gray markets, you can be a little bit more aggressive with those things. And as you go to more regulated, mature markets, you can't really do that stuff so i assume yeah that's the route that gg is taking and um you know and, and like yeah if, if they're in more regulated markets they're gonna have to cut that stuff out um yeah 
yeah, it does seem to be a, a genuine move or, or at least from people I've heard within GG to try to segue to something, uh, the, the, word, the word or phrase white label has been used a lot. Um, so yeah. perhaps that is in their future. Uh, turning now to poker coaching, Dara, uh, you do a lot of work with Faraz with uh, Jacket Coaching. How did that come to be initially? Yeah, so it pretty much oh, came sorry, to Sorry, Faraz, that's, that one's for Dara. I want to know how Dara oh, sorry, sorry. saddled to your horse. Sorry. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully oh, how that answer. But my, my my memory of this it pretty much came out of the uh, the initial interview we did with Faraz for the Chip Race, yeah. um, and then afterwards myself and Faraz were talking, uh, and you know I had written a book on satellites, so initially I came in to do some specific stuff on satellites, and it sort of developed on from there. Faraz can go now. Okay, for us, take it from there. <laughs> no, I, I thought you were asking how, I, why, or how jockey coaching started. Uh, but yeah, what, what Dara said was pretty much accurate. Yeah, we, we, we wanted, we were doing a WSP prep series. I think it was, was it last WSOP or two WSOPs ago? And, um, you know, we, we needed a satellite expert. So it was a no brainer to have Dara come in there. And he did a great job. The students loved him. So it was like, all right, what other topics do you want to teach? And now he's basically doing regular monthly lessons for us. Well, seeing as you almost answered that question, maybe also give you a little sense of how Jacket Coaching came to be. I know it yeah. was in existence before Dara. Yeah. So basically when, you know, all the COVID lockdown stuff happened, the tours shut down and I didn't have live tournaments to go play anymore. So I was just trying to figure out how I'm going to spend my time. And I'd always gotten a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching requests, but didn't really have time for them. So I started just taking those clients and I got really into it and, um, you know, really tried to optimize it and get as many clients as I can, do as many sessions as I can. I ended up coaching about 120 players within like a year and a half span. And um, I had, you know, more people reaching out that I couldn't take on and some people wanted a lower price point. So it just seemed like the obvious next step was like, okay, let me try group coaching. So, you know, then I started these weekly group coaching lessons and that's, was kind of the birth of jockey coaching where it's in, we still do that today. It's weekly group coaching sessions. They get recorded, they get edited, they get put into a library, they get put in learning paths. And now we have like over 120 training videos uh, covering all the different subjects. Um, we got a few other coaches as well. We got, you know, Thomas Bovine, who's a crusher, uh, Jeremy Menard, uh, Fausto Valdez, and of course, Dara, so yeah, it's a full blown training site now, and it's going really well. Our students have been crushing. Last WSB, we had about uh, they had about four final tables. We had a student get twenty uh, eighth in the main event as well. So I think between those five events, they cash for one point five mil. Um, yeah, it's been it's been awesome because a lot of my students are like serious recreationals that have a job, have a business, and for these people, the solutions that are out there for pros aren't always the best fit. You know, they don't have 40 hours a week to grind solvers. So I'm really coming up with solutions that suit, you know, their lifestyles. And it's, it's been awesome to work, work with a wide range of people from different backgrounds. And Faris, how would you describe your approach to coaching recreational players in particular? And what do you think distinguishes it from other sites and the way they, they do things? Yeah. So uh, I guess, you know, really two things. Um, one is, uh, you know, I realize what works so well in one-on-one -on -one coaching is that I'm engaging with them and asking them to repeat the takeaways. And I do that in the group coaching lessons. So I, I notice a lot of training videos or, or even seminars. It's just one person talking, everyone else is listening. And then they, some people might go out there and ask some questions. In my lessons, I'm in there being like, all right, what would you do in this spot? Why? Explain yourself. And then I'll explain a takeaway. And then I'll be like, all right, I want you guys to repeat the takeaways in the chat. Uh, because I'm really big on when you see things, you know, visually, audibly, and then you also have to repeat it back. That's when you get a really deeper understanding of the spot. So it's really highly engaging. Uh, the other part is uh, I think a lot of people who go on to training sites just don't even know how to study or have the right tool set up. So something that I'm really big on is from day one, I'm sending them, you know, here's a seven minute video, how to write down hand histories. Here's how to talk hands in the Discord group. Here's how to set up and use these basic tools. This is the ones everyone should be using. This is the ones only if you're more advanced. So I'm really helping people set up the learning environment to even have a chance to succeed and use, you know, the training to their advantage. 
And Dara, turning to you now, obviously in your coaching, you, you work for Faraz, you also freelance and take on students of varying different standards. I know there's very high class uh, nosebleed players in there, but there's also some recreationals too. What do you think the biggest mistake you um, you think other coaches make when trying to coach recreationals? I'm guessing you've got a lot of feedback on that front. Yeah, I think I, I think probably the biggest mistake they make is just it's a it's, it's a sort of a one size fits all approach, and um, I've I've found that that actually every single student is individual, and usually the first session is trying to work out what's the best uh, learning plan for them. Um, what's the best way to present the information? What's the best way to uh, what to cover? How to cover, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like a lot of what Faraz is talking about, and, and one of the reasons why I like working for Faraz is I think we pretty much share uh, share opinions on this. Is um, Faraz is unusual for a high level player in that he's sort of like just a really good communicator. He understands how to communicate his message rather than just understanding the concept. And that's something a lot of high level play, level players lack. And they just talk over their, their students and the students, you know, they might pick up little bit, bits and pieces here and there, but it's really not very effective for them. There's always this debate in coaching, which is uh, sort of like, um, you can phrase it as like, show me your results. Um, I just did a session with a recreational um, before and, and he said he watched a Charlie Carroll stream and Charlie was dumping on most coaches saying that they can't even beat the games, et cetera, et cetera. And there is always that sort of like bias among elite players that the best players must be the best coaches. And that really isn't the case. Um, the secondary part of that, the communication is much more important and understanding your students and understanding how they learn and how they think, that's really uh, the key, in my opinion. So I would say the biggest mistake, and I think this is also true of poker, the biggest mistake most poker players make is that, is, is that they think other people think the way they do. And, you know, we all we all think differently. And you kind of, ha- once you understand how somebody else thinks, you can deconstruct their game and you can also improve their game. Um, you, can, you can work out how best to communicate uh, the information to them. Um, and, and then the other thing, obviously, and for us touched on this too with recreations, is they just don't have, you know, they're not going to do spend 16 hours a day with the solvers. So really, it's sort of like giving them a, a, a clear roadmap of what's the best stuff to study and how to study that, um, that, that, that gets them the maximum impact. Yeah, D- Dara super nailed it. I mean, I, I had a time where I paid like $700 an hour for like coaching from a player that crushes high rollers. And then, and I just felt like they weren't good at communicating the information to me, um, organizing information. And then a month later, I paid two hundred dollars an hour coaching from someone else that was, uh, you know, mid stakes player, and I learned way more in that session. Um, so just to put things into perspective, obviously one was a much better player, but the other was a much better coach. Yeah, yeah great point. Uh, I think one that is probably necessary to say. I think there is that. Uh, bias the moment that you know you have to have been at the very top or you know in the nosebleeds currently battling it out to to, to be able to uh, pass on worthwhile information for us in the modern poker solver paradigm that i guess we we must admit we're all in there is a, a tendency maybe to undervalue that which was very important in the prior paradigm and um, it struck me that community building is an essential part of what you try to instill in players yeah. making like-minded open-minded friends with whom you have a, a comfort level when talking about some lines you've taken, that type of thing. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the most important ways that I got better at poker was being able to have the right friend circle to talk poker with. Um, even just like, am I using the right tools? Am I using them correctly? Uh, knowing, you know, what are the softest games right now? And kind of, you know, all, all this information if you're not talking with the right people, you're going to get it three years later. And by then the trends are changing. So I, I'm huge on having a community to talk about these things. And that's why I started our student discord group because majority of my students from my one-on-ones, I would ask them and almost all of them did not have people to talk poker with. They're just like, yeah, my friends don't take it as serious. I do. And so on. So now I've really connected all my students together and they're so much more powerful together. Um, so, yeah, I, I think if you don't have one, um, you know, be social at these live tournaments, go meet people. Sure, it might take meeting 30, 40 people until you really click with someone, but it's worth it. Um, or, you know, go and get into these, you know, Discord communities uh, that are run by training sites and so on. 
Well said. Um, you tweeted recently how last year your Jacka coaching students crushed you. You reiterated that there a moment ago. Four final tables, a 24th place finish, 1.3, 1.4 million in cashes uh, from just those five events alone. And I'm sure lots more besides. Um, that's on top of the 135k that one of your students won with the Jack I call versus one of the best cash game players in the world. I'm talking, of course, about Robbie J. Lou. And don't worry, I'm not going to drag up that story again. But I am interested in one aspect here, which is that what is your feelings around responsibility when it comes to your students? You spoke out to defend Robbie in the aftermath of that hand and give some background on the type of player she was. Uh, I know you make a big effort to be on the rail for other students too. Angela Jordan talked about that when she was on her show. Do you feel similarly responsible for all your students? Uh, what are those relationships like? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm I'm very close to a lot of my students. That's something that I'm really big on. I try to get to know and meet in face, you know, face to face or on calls or at least in the chat and the Discord as many students as I can. Uh, I just feel like that's the best way I'm going to have my finger on the pulse of what's going on with them, what they're struggling with. How can I help them and so on? Um, yeah, in terms of kind of the Robbie situation, like obviously, like uh, you know, I can I don't ha- I didn't have any more information than the whole world had as far as kind of so you know I can't say anything more than that. But what I can speak to is my previous experiences with my students and how they normally communicate with me. Uh, so in that situation, I just wanted to share that hey, I'm hearing a lot of people say that this person's guilty or innocent because of X, Y, Z. And I'm like, well, I actually have like plenty of personal conversations with this person that would kind of prove that wrong. So I'm going to share that information. But as far as, you know, all the other stuff, like that's not really for me to say, I'm just going to share the information that I have. You do what you want with it. Fair enough. Uh, Speaking of the coach student relationship, Dara, you tweeted last week as well about your triple crown of sorts. Three of your students won tournaments on the same night. Can you tell us more about that and how it made you feel? Yeah, it was great. Great news to thing. Similar for us, like I I tried to keep in contact with all my students, not just when we're having sessions or planning sessions, but just in general how things are going for them in poker because that that often uh, feeds into you know how how I approach future sessions so they do tend to tell me when they have their successes and that and it, it it always feels really good and this particular morning I woke up to basically messages from three different students uh two two of which had won online tournaments one of which had won a, a live tournament and I I realized it was the first time that I'd sort of like got three in a single day. Um, and it, it, it was a great feeling, you know, back in the days when I grinded more online, one thing I used to chase were pocket fives, um, triple crowns, where you have to win three online tournaments in different sites in a week. And that I use that sort of as a motivator. As a coach, it's a similar thing. Like I, I get a great buzz when I get um, that, that kind of feedback from students. And often they tell me about hands that they played in a certain way, which they wouldn't have played previously in. But because of something we had covered in the last session, uh, they, they they played the spot differently and it worked out really well for them. You obviously have to be careful because you know there's variance, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but 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 it is very rewarding to see your students do well. And you know, similar to Faraz taking pride in how well the students did at the WSP last year, I always take pride when any of my students uh, do well or win a tournament. Yeah, fantastic to, to hear about that. Speaking of the WSOP, and you sort of uh, foreshadowed it earlier on, WSOP, WSOP prep is a big part of what you offer for us. You've done that for a few years in a row, and I believe you're planning something similar this year. Yeah, it's coming up pretty soon. So May 3rd, we're starting launching a WSOP prep series. And basically what it is, is it's, uh, it's a lesson every week for six weeks um, that prepares you up till June 3rd. And then after June 3rd, we're going to continue with four more lessons during the series. And those are going to be more hand history reviews where, you know, I'll take my millionaire maker and monster stack hands and review them with students. I'm going to let students submit their hands. Um, So that's during the series. And then the prep series is going to be basically me going through what are the most important spots that you need to get better at for WSRP. And that's going to be things like things like, okay, there's a lot of multi-way pots. People don't squeeze enough. Um, you know, dealing with playing out of the big blind, which you're going to be a lot. You, how do you check raise in the big blind and all that kind of stuff? So, um, yeah, we kind of like the first three lessons are really geared towards kind of newer students that are newer to studying and stuff like that. And then after that, we kind of pick it up quite quite quickly. Um, and all these lessons are recorded and stuff like that, so if people cannot make it live. They can always 
you know, go back and watch it as well. So yeah, if you're a new student, kind of been wanting to take it more serious, um, this is like one of the best entry points because of, you know, we kind of take it slow in the first few lessons. And um, yeah, just check out the website, jockeycoaching.com if you want to, um, if you want to be a part of that uh, prep series. Very cool. Well, speaking of the World Series, transitioning now to something kind of World Series related uh, tends to come up this time of the year, and that is markup or perhaps more generally people selling action for the WSOP. Jamie Kerstetter tweeted this week that uh, Sean Deeb is too skinny and too happy now to mark up police anyone, so it's safe to post your summer schedules to Twitter again. Um, it's certainly true that Sean likes to cast a judgmental eye over some of the action being offered. Uh, but to be fair, that is exactly what people should do in search of plus EV situations, plus EV sweats. Um, for as last week you tweeted, trying to convince someone you're good at poker or worth backing by simply linking to your Hendon Bob results is going to have the opposite effect to anyone who's actually a good player themselves. For me, this is always an instant flag. They probably aren't long-term plus EV. Can you elaborate on that and tell us? First of all, what was that tweet out of line? I, I, think I, I think I upset a lot of people with that tweet. <laughs> that, <laughs> um, I, I don't know if some of it got taken out of context or not, um, but definitely that that was geared towards, you know, people trying to play professionally and trying to get backing. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, your hand and mob, all it really tells people is what stakes you play and how often you play. That's pretty much all it tells you, which is relevant, of course. Um, but that is not your pitch. Like your hand and mob is a small part of your pitch. Um, you cannot just send that and expect that, oh, I'm, I'm a good player because of this. So, um, you know, it, it's difficult to just prove you're a winning player from a cold message. The only way you could really do that is if you play online poker, you have a shark scope of at least, you know, a thousand or more tournaments with a positive ROI. If you don't play online, you just play live. Then the only way you're going to be able to convince someone you're good is by actually, you know, talking poker with them in them hearing your thought process, um, them seeing some hands of yours, or you getting a referral from someone that they really trust is a good player and knows your game well. Um, cause a, a lot of people's response to that was like, well, what do you want me to do then? You know, I don't play online. That's like, I'm not saying that it's a, it's a problem. It's just, this is the reality of the situation. It's, it's very hard to just show someone something and prove that you're a good player, unless you have a shark scope that looks really good. And, and that, that's it. You know, it's just the harsh reality, I guess. Yeah. Shark scope, certainly uh, a much more reliable I, I, I will, measure. I will say one thing though, cause I had a lot of people DM me after that saying like, oh, you know, you're right. But like, what do I do? I really want to get backing. So how do I accomplish this? Um, yeah, I think you have two paths. I think one is you really go out of your way to try to network and meet players. And honestly, you just need to meet one player sometimes because if you meet one player that you get to talk hands with and they believe in your game, now you get access to their circle and their friends. And sometimes that's all it takes. It's like, all right, this guy's backing this person. I trust their judgment. So I'll back them now. And now before you know it, you have five reliable people backing you, you know, maybe answering your hand history questions and so on. So even though it may feel like a lot of work, like maybe you need to talk to a hundred people to land one person and, and, and that's enough. Um, other advice I would give is uh, make an email list. Like something that I've always done when I want to sell action is, Anyone who's ever interested, I grab their email, I have it on the spreadsheet. So now when I want to sell action, I don't have to remember who all the people the message are. I just send a blast to that email list or go one by one if I only have a few spots left. Um, so that definitely helps. Um, and then and then the other route is, um, you know, if you want to play online, then go play online and build the track record. That's going to help, you know, getting people's attention a lot faster. Yeah, that's a great advice there. Dara, you and I have staked people together in the past. You've done a bit of staking on your own too and with other people as well. We both like to buy action, it's fair to say too, just buying a you know a sweat in someone's WSOP main or EPT or whatever it happens to be. Also, what do you look for most of all? And are there any warning signs that something might not be a good investment? Yeah, well, in terms of uh, there, there are essentially different things: buying pieces of people and 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 backing them or staking them over long term. In terms of staking people, like I've always focused on the personality. Um, and I, you know, the first person I staked, um, and we, you know, I'm not revealing anything 
unrevealed here. We've talked about this in the past on the show was it was Dara Davy and. When I chose Dara from the pool of Irish players to stake, there was quite a lot of surprise because he wasn't seen at the time as one of the high flyers. But the thing that which had impressed me about Dara was his temperament and his work ethic. And, um, you know, there there was a couple of things. When I played with him, he was very unostentatious at the table, uh, but clearly very dialed in and focused. And he actually stood out from some of the other Irish players who were sort of, you know, live wires at the table, let's say, and they were trying all sorts of fancy plays um and the second thing which stuck out was after he took a particularly bad beat in a big tournament i saw him grinding a small side event not 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 very long afterwards and and playing very well so i thought this okay this is a guy who understands variance and who will work hard and 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 so on and you know dara still remains in my mind the ideal uh of of the players that i backed because he had he had no leaks he worked hard he 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 didn't have an ego um he, he he applied himself very well. And these were all personal traits. It's fair to say, and you know this personally, David, because you were the person I turned to coach and when we realized that he actually wasn't very good at poker at the time. It's far more important that they be coachable and that they le- that they be willing to learn and able to put the work in rather than that they that, that they be there right now. Um, so that's always been sort of my approach when it comes to staking people full time. I'm not that concerned where their game is right now. It's where I think it can get to. And that that does depend on the other traits. In terms of buying percentages of people, you know, that's that that's a more loose sort of fun sweat thing. So really, I guess two things spring to mind. First of all, you have to trust the person that they won't do a runner if they somehow win the WSP main event. Um uh, that's that's point number one. And point number two is I and I, I actually wrote a piece which similar to Fraz, I got far more blowback on than that than I expected. But I wrote a piece that I would rather stake somebody in the WSP who had never played live but was a winning online player than an old school live pro who had who, who, who had a very good hand and mob. And my reasoning for that was these guys just they get deep in tournaments a lot, they get to final tables a lot, and they just understand these high equity spots they practice them much more whereas there are a lot of guys with very good mobs, but it really all that happened is they ran good in two or three tournaments back in the day um and i had to chuckle i i did imme- as soon as i saw Perez's tweet i i thought first of all he's completely right and secondly a lot of people are going to be very upset about this <laughs> because most of the people who come to me for you gotta back-, back me up then dara <laughs> <laughs> Most of the people he, come he, to because he's a great coach for us. You see, he wanted you to experience it for yourself. He knew yeah. it was a lesson. <laughs> Most of the people who come to me for backing, even now, it's it's pretty much a hand and mob. And you know, there, there have been some comical ones, uh, and I'm I'm not going to name anybody. And I don't think this person is still in poker, but I do remember about eight years ago, some guy got a relatively big score on the Irish scene, and he immediately contacted me, more or less demanding coaching that he had, you know, as as the hot new thing, I clearly had to. I, I clearly had to back him because I was backing lesser players like Tara Davy, and the only thing he sent me was his hand and mob, which was two results: his recent big one and a, and a, and a small one before. And I said to him, "Well, do you play online?" And he said, "Yeah, a little bit." So I said, "Okay, can you send me a hand history?" And he literally sent me a screenshot of his account balance, <laughs> which incidentally was zero. So. So everything about this guy was like, I definitely don't want to uh, back this guy. And as I said, I don't think he's still in poker. So I think I, I probably made the wise decision there. Mm-hmm. Well, what I really love about that story about Derek Davey is he's a far better player than I am. And uh, just the idea that there was a time, a, a brief period of time when he was under your wing that you entrusted uh, a bit of coaching of him to me. And uh, and yeah, actually at the time when I think back, uh, and I don't think Darren would, uh, you know, he would acknowledge the reality of it. He just had a few fundamental sort of short stack leaks, which of course online it's, you know, you really want to have your, you know, 25 big blind and below game nailed on. And I guess he had come from a, a cash game background, uh, being a big winner in the Fitz uh, casino in Dublin for many years. And, you know, obviously had had some good results in some live stuff too. Um, but, you know, nothing that that was stand out. So like you said, it, it was taken as a surprise when he was the guy you picked, but, uh, but, but, but the reality, or kind of backing up your point there, is that like the moment you did explain something to Dara, the moment you do realize that someone has a really good poker brain, which is what you recognize right away, is you know they're going to be coachable. You know that, you know, 
it, it doesn't matter exactly what you said, where they are now, it's where you can get them to and how responsive they'll be to coaching. And for us, going back to you for a final point, maybe on the coaching stuff, do you often get students where you go, oh, your game is kind of in the bin right now, but I really understand how you you know, respond to the last session with some good questions or some, you know, just a good poker brain, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, totally. Um, I mean, I it, it's rare for me to meet a student that I don't think like has a ton of potential. Um, every once in a while, I'll get a student where I'm struggling to figure out how to get through them. But then eventually, like after a couple of sessions, like it, it clicks. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, everybody's situation is different. Um, some people it's just laziness and they're not doing the work off the table and they need someone to kind of give them some homework. Um, other people, it's like, they just have the wrong logic they're using and they're kind of going down this rabbit holes that you kind of need to steer them in the right direction. Um, other people it's they're jumping into like way too much stuff in the weeds with the solvers and kind of not simplifying stuff enough. So, I mean, there's so many different examples of like how people are smart, but like there's just so many like wrong paths you can go down and just having a simple conversation to bounce stuff back and forth. Someone could steer you into the right path. It's like, Hey, I wasted a year doing this mistake. You know, don't waste more than another week on that. No, great advice again. Um, before we go, I want to give a shout out uh, actually to you guys out there. We had our first ever chip race series on Unibet Poker last week, and it went better than we could have hoped, generating way over the 200K guaranteed. In fact, over 230K ended up in the combined prize pools in what were tournaments, mostly added to our usual schedule. A little trick I noticed a lot of the sites do is they just rebrand their biggest nightly to be their special thing. We didn't do that, actually, for the most part. We added it on and made it another extra tournament. So there was a bit of pressure on us hitting those guarantees, and we really didn't have any trouble in the end, and that's testament to, I guess, how loyal the, the, the Unibet faithful are, but also the, the Chip Race uh, fans who, who I'm sure tuned in in a big way as well. Dara, your feelings about it. We obviously got a, a bit of feedback and, uh, you know, not all positive. Some people had some very valid criticisms about, you know, some structural stuff in, in the festival that we can maybe look at for another one. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great when people do come back with constructive criticism um, because that that will help us make it better next time. Overall, the series was obviously a huge success. And from talking to um, both students and just sort of general chip race fans that I that I that I chat to on and off. One thing that really came across is that there, w- there was a sense of a lot of guys went out of their way to make sure that they played it, just out of yeah. loyalty to us, and 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 and, and that's very heartening. Um, you know, people. It, it's nice to hear that people appreciate what we do, but it's also it's even nicer if they support something like this, um, because you know, had it fallen flat on its face and you know there had been massive overlays it certainly wouldn't have been good for us. Um, so we're very grateful to those people. And, you know, it's, re- it's really nice that people do sort of recognize that that's the way they can support the show. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Uh, as a result, I'm pretty confident that we will be doing another one of these in the future. And we will bear in mind some of the, 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 the criticism as well and try and make it even better than it was first time out. I also want to give a shout out to Alex Henry and Yvonne Montilegre, uh, who are putting on the Unibet Deep Stack Open Powered Multi Poker Festival right now. Well, that's a, a mouthful. I'm actually going straight from here uh, after this to go play that. Uh, speaking of Dara Davey earlier in the show, I know he's made the trip to Malta, so he's going to be here as well, battling it out. Uh, I, I know he has uh, put his name, etched his name on that uh, Deep Stack Open belt that is up for grabs as part of this as well. Um, but uh, look, we had tremendous success with the satellites for this one, with roughly a dozen package qualifiers every week between the Unibet.f4 client and the Unibet.com client. We also ran satellites to the Hendon Mob Championship, which is a side event at this NPF festival. Dara, we're very sorry that you're not making the trip for this one. I was hoping we might see it, but um, maybe we'll see it in Malta in the near future. I don't know. Yeah, it's possible. I might make the trip in May at some stage. Uh, I know for the festival. Um, for for this weekend, I'm occupied with the monster. Um, the art, the the new big festival on the uh, Irish calendar. Not not very brave slot. It has to be said. Not too long after the Irish Open, but I do think that's going to be a huge success. Most of the rest of this week uh, will will be occupied by the monster for me. Um, they have a mystery bounty. We have mystery bounty book coming out soon, so uh, it's a format I'm very much aware of at the moment and um 
uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's it's great to see our poker thriving in Ireland. Like the Irish poker tour has really been going from strength to strength. So there's actually less impetus for me now to travel um, for for for, uh, for live poker. Well, speaking of travel, for us, what is on the horizon for you? Obviously, the World Series is not too far away, but there's probably time for a cheeky little festival between now and then as well. Not when you got the WSB Prep Series. Um, <laughs> yeah, my my May is packed. Um, you know, a- April has been, you know, getting those sessions ready, getting the word out. And now May, um, you know, really fully focused on helping my students get prepared. So, yeah, this is like a super busy period for me. And then, yeah, just June, July, playing the series, um, you know, playing a bunch of no limit events every day. That's about it. I try, I try not to I try not to plan past that uh, because just the, the series is so intense and you don't know what you're going to feel like doing after that. But obviously, um, Hard Rock and Barcelona in August are always very tempting. Mm-hmm. And usually, well, you don't know how rich you're going to be or how poor you're going to be. This is exactly the thing. Like, I was talking to my uh, PokerStars VIP manager this morning, and he, and he said, like, what about Barcelona and Cyprus after the uh, WSB? And I said, I never think about anything after the WSB. Yeah, that's I don't the know. end of the year. Yeah, it's the end of the year for me. I don't know how uh, how much it, it's going to take out of me, both financially, but also just emotionally. Like, you could come from the WSB back completely drained and not want to do live poker again for a while. I have a, I have a wedding in Chicago after the series, so that's that's my first tour stop. <laughs> that's always nice as well. Um, there are a lot of Unibet partnered events on the horizon, most notably the festival series that Dara mentioned there, uh, which is also here in Malta next month. Qualifiers for that are currently on the client. Finally, there's also a big announcement coming up, which we can probably talk about in the next episode, which involves, I want to say, a wintertime Unibet Open uh, for later in this year. Dara, I know you're looking forward to that one, but we have to keep... Yeah, please do keep quiet about this. You've you've already leaked it a few times and it hasn't happened. So (laughs) let's wait for the official announcement on this one, David. Um, I mean, you are known as Leaky Lappin in Unibet circles, but uh, yeah, hopefully hopefully we, we, we will have a, an official announcement to work with soon. Absolutely. Well, look, it remains for me to thank our very special guest this week for us, Jacka. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Great to have you for us. And, and thank you too, Dara. Yeah, thank you. And uh, as part of um, Faraz's WSP prep thing on, on Jacka coaching, I will be doing a a hand history review of how I qualified for the WSP main event this year. Ooh, and that, that 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 gained a lot of attention because somebody noticed on the screenshot I posted that I was only in the tournament for 21 minutes. So <laughs> I want to assure people, uh, first of all, it it proves that the Max Lay strategy does work. But secondly, uh, the um, the webinar that, I, that I'm that i doing at the start of June will be longer than 21 minutes. Um, I'll probably throw in some Irish Open satellites as well. Um, and you guys got a discount code for them. And we have a discount code, exactly. Yeah. yeah, if you use the uh, discount code DOG15, you get a, uh, you, or DARA15, it is actually, yeah, DARA15, you uh, you get a discount. So for, for I think WSP preparation, like that's what most serious poker players who are going to WSP are focusing on. You know, my latest piece on VSO, which I don't think is up yet, but it is on sort of the whole idea that you have to prepare for the WSP. It can be such a, overwhelming experience that if you go there unprepared it can it can just run over you yeah how to win your wsop main event seat in the time it takes your pizza to cook in the oven it's uh yeah. it's a gimmick i think we can get we can get by it's very sellable actually that's great that's some great clickbait there i like it <laughs> take care guys appreciate right. it peace out